This last piece might raise some ethical issues about when we are attempting to force predictive behavior on audiences that maybe aren't cooperative. Um, so. The laugh tracks the exact, is a perfect example of that, one of the arguments for its use, um, was that the live audience was unreliable, right, uh, to give the reactions that they needed. So um, the laugh track was sort of introduced as a way to make, to stabilize sort of audience reaction. So I, I mean, I, I agree that that is part of the instrumentality, right, of, of these sorts of examples. but. Um, what I'm trying to get at, too, in terms of this, the, the repetition of the laugh track, it starts to become strange or uncanny or unusual, and that opens up the possibility of a different kind of agency beyond right, this level of the signifier um, that, uh, that we might be able to harness for more liberatory potentials. And I, I, uh, or I don't know if I want to use that word. But, um, but that also, I think, relates in some sense to some of what Barb's talking about in terms of the, the undermining of the, the image of this sort of hegemonic structure um, that's continually reinforced. This is ridiculous, trying to speak into a microphone that's not working. <laughs> but but um, uh, it looks cool. It's recording. Oh, it's recording. Yeah. Okay, so there is, there is a point for historicity. I um, wanted to pick up on the question that the previous questioner asked because I'm thinking about. I mean, and you you just said that the, the project has something to do with um, with a kind of agency that is excessive, that is non-identical with the one, and I can see how that um, traces across the papers. I have a little bit of a problem, like while on the one hand, I mean, I was reading the captions of the of the, uh, the quotations that are on the wall here, and this one over here is, smite the rocks with the rod of knowledge, <laughs> and fountains of unstinted wealth will gush forth. I mean, okay, so I don't want to be in the one, you know, like the rod of knowledge, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be, be the phallus. Okay, so, but on the <laughs> other hand, but on the other hand, what does that uh, agency that is born of that excess look like? And I think Trevor might have said, suggested something to me um, when he got up and said mic check, which I thought was a joke about Occupy, the Occupy movement. Is that? <laughs> All right. Um, well, because the Occupy movement uses this form of repetition, um, which is intriguing, um, where a mic check is when you're in a collective public space and you don't have amplified sound, so you have to have the crowd, it started in Seattle, you have to have the crowd repeat after you so that everybody can hear what's said and there's a binding together, which has a coercive function but also has a, an instrumental one. And so I'm left with the question of, um, and a skepticism about what does this kind of agency um, get us? Because finally, uh, George Johnson, died violently and a pauper and is buried in an unmarked grave. So, I mean, he got a good laugh in, but what kind of agency was there in that laughter? It's not about George Johnson. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, George Johnson also killed two of his wives, um, <laughs> which is why I begin with, you might find him down by the river, um, hat tip to Neil Young. Um, well, I don't know what that agency looks like. I mean, that's the that's kind of the point um, in the sense that um, it's not that I would uh, that I, that I'm advocating some sort of precluding of organized political agency in in terms that that you're quite familiar with, but rather that if we if we think about uh, if we think about this repetition compulsion or laughter, um, not as this sort of pre-programmed thing, but as the possibility of agency that's unscripted, right? That is not that that is open. Um, then there's a potential for human for human change. There's a potential for that that not everything's closed up or sewed up in advance. So it's the recognition of that of that font of of enjoyment beyond. Um, mere pleasure beyond um, something that's unpleasant or uh, something that we could sort of isolate in a representational way um, that that I, I'm hoping is sort of inspiration of possibility. So, I mean, both and is my answer. But. I'm just going to stand up. Uh, uh, I have two pieces of this, one, one for Josh. Um, Josh, you, um, I don't know if you get the New York Times, but a week or so ago, there was an obituary for a guy named John Rich, who was one of the 
directors of All in the Family, and there was an anecdote of the famous episode in which Sammy Davis Jr. visits the Bunker family, and the very last bit of it is um, Sammy Davis Jr. asks for a photo with Archie Bunker, and right when the flash is about to go off, he turns and, and kisses him on the cheek. And the director thought of that, it was not in the script, and so then they worked it through. And the audience reaction, they had a live audience, not a canned um, laugh track, and it went on for 40 minutes, and it was so loud that they actually had to dial it back when they, um, I, I don't know if it was broadcast live, I don't think that show was broadcast live, but when they actually broadcast it, they had to dial it back. So there's kind of an interesting sort of opposite to your, your premise that I think you know you might want to take into account. And then in the same kind of flipping over, Barbara, I wanted to raise the problem that um, I kind of find it horrible that the Holocaust Museum has now become the place to take juvenile delinquents and dictators and terrorists as kind of a pharmacopoeia, you know, as kind of an inoculation and say, see, it's sort of like become the um, outward bound for people who are so sociopaths. And I really, I really, I know that it may have been part of the intent of any museum, and in that museum in particular, to try and unsettle and try and make people question their reactions um, I, you know, and I, I like the whole thing about it being not the patriotic buy-in, but I, I kind of, I, I either find it offensive of the museum or I find it offensive of the people who use it that way to say that this kind of exposure, you know, of anybody to this kind of thing is gonna have this kind of therapeutic effect. And my students, I, if your freshman students are like my freshman students, they're always writing these sentences about how they were exposed to Shakespeare. And I always use this opening <laughs> code gesture. And I, you know, they were, and, and I, find, I find that the Holocaust Museum, I find that as almost a misuse of it because it's so, it's so uh, simplistic. Of the, of the kinds of difficulties of who the person is who's going in and what their, you know, what's their kairos, you know, for going and for people to trot them through it. I, 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 it has been something that's disturbed me for as long as the museum's been open. So I'd be interested in your reaction to that. So my presumption would be you'd have the same problem with any museum anywhere that did that. Any museum anywhere that did that. Did what? Exposed patrons or trotted patrons through a space where atrocity is exposed. I actually, I can give you another counterexample. The, um, in Fredericksburg, there's the Nimitz Museum, or there's the Museum of the War in the Pacific, and, there, and it's recently been reopened. It was totally redesigned. It has many of the things that the Holocaust Museum has. If you go into the Pearl Harbor Day uh, exhibit, it has uh, vibration built in. It has sound built in. So you're supposed to feel like you're at Pearl Harbor. And the setup of the exhibit is one that demonizes the Japanese because a big, a huge sequence at the beginning is about how um, militaristic and violent they were. And there is one room dedicated to Hiroshima, of the entire museum. So, you know, you'd have to say that maybe you could say, okay, trotting through that is going to, you know, just underscore the um, identification of patriotism that you're saying the Holocaust Museum interrupts. Interrupts. Right. But, you know, I, um, I, I'm just troubled at the idea of saying that museums. Um, maybe it goes back to the predictability question. Well, that would be where I think I would articulate here because my argument is not that the Holocaust Museum will function rhetorically in the same way at different conjunctures. 
What I am arguing is in this particular conjuncture, in 1993, the Holocaust Memorial Museum opened, right, between, but particularly toward the end of the century, 1998, World War II is a cottage industry. You have Saving Private Ryan. You have the greatest generation in like eight forms, bestseller on the New York Times list, blah, blah, blah. You have this, is it becomes a discourse formation that celebrates a particular vision and version of World War II. My argument is that at that conjuncture, the Holocaust Museum is a singular memory text insofar as it contests that totalized narrative of World War II was the moment in which we, as a con right, as Rorty says, we achieved, even Rorty's saying it, we achieved our country. And instead, it troubles that suturing of the story. And uh, you will see across the ex exhibit moments at which that totalized narrative breaks apart. Right, so you get a very, you get, you're going along, you're going along, you open up with this big thing, but you're going along, going along, and you learn of uh, that um, the US government and scientists knew, in fact, about the uh, Berks and Belts and the death camps, blah, 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 and did nothing. It doesn't explain why we did nothing. It doesn't, right? It's just we did nothing. Then you go along, right? Uh, a ship with 600, I can't quite remember, right? Um, um, Jews came to our shores. We turned it away. They were then turned back and exterminated in a camp. Boom. I mean, this is a and the GI, the iconic, you know, to use the language of Harriman and Lucades, you know, this iconic citizen subject, right, is rhetorically deflated or diminished over the course of this exhibit. And for me, most important is, as I make the argument, I mean, we're not talking about this just in museums uh, and movies. We're talking about the discourse of the, the rhetoric of the GI as determining who's going to make decisions at the Smithsonian Museum about what an exhibit on the Enola Gay is going to look at. And they're saying, our truth is the only truth. And the reason why we know, and I have an analysis of how that rhetoric of that expropriates in a vicious way Right, the discourse, the rhetoric, the the um, what Wendy Brown calls right, um, um, the the uh, rhetoric of pain that was was the signature of civil rights movement rhetoric, of women's movement rhetoric, etc. How the conservative forces expropriates right that rhetoric of pain and suffering and turns it to their own hegemonic advantage so i'm not sure maybe i wasn't clear but ultimately i would arg i would agree i think politically i would agree with you i think at a particular conjuncture the Holocaust Memorial Museum is doing something to that national narrative that none of the other right real national, nationally sanctioned um, remembrances are doing with respect to the, that moment. Yeah, so you could agree and say that, you know, museums last, you know, they, they persist in, in that terminology. But rhetorically, they don't function in the same way, necessarily. As the, as the, as the you know, discourse formation changes, then, it's going to function rhetorically in a different way. I mean, that's where, right, it's, it's not predictable, right? Because it's an articulatory effect. It's the, the rhetorical effectivity of the exhibit, museum, et cetera, is not given in and by the text alone. It's an articulatory effect. Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> I have a question for uh, Alex. Um, Ian, you know, there's both comm studies and rhetorical studies are, uh, in, in um, the English side in the room. Um, I'm just learning about object-oriented ontology. Um, we briefly read some stuff in class. Can you give like a little uh, synoptic for, I know some of our graduate students are in here too, about what that approach is, how, that, how that's different or how that's emerged in the last, say, you know, five years or so? I mean, I yeah, yeah I just a little a thumbnail. It. Yes, yeah. okay, um, I, I'll give it a shot. So uh, there are two, two kinds of terms here, one is, uh, speculative realism, which is a broader uh, kind of concept and would include people like uh, Mia Su, right? Um, and, uh, and basically, in a nutshell, the idea of speculative realism is to uh, move away from what they term the correlationist tradition of philosophy, which goes back to Kant primarily, and uh, essentially says that you know, we can only know the world through you know, our own terms or through our own language and creates a philosophy that uh, certainly as we experience it uh, is largely focused on issues of representation, epistemology, discourse, and so on. Uh, speculative realism doesn't say that um, we can uh, you know, get past that problem or solve that problem, but it, it suggests that there is in fact a world beyond, uh, you know, what Miyasu refers to as the great outdoors, right? That uh, there is a world beyond that sort of limited correlationist framework that we need to address in some way. And so when we look at object-oriented ontology, which would then be, you know, a, a sort of initiated by Graham Harmon's work primarily, and then uh, more re recently people like uh, Ian Bogust and Levy Bryant and Timothy Morton, and they all have you know, somewhat different versions of it, so it's not like a, I wouldn't want to suggest that there's this like, you know, monolithic school here. Uh, but what Harmon suggests is that the problem that we encounter when um, we recognize that language is not sufficient to understanding the world, that there's something else out there, uh, is not just a problem that exists for humans, that it's a problem of relation among all objects, which is where we get this sort of fundamental conception of object-oriented ontology, which is that all objects withdraw from one another. And so that's kind of the, the basic uh, tenant of an object-oriented ontology. And then from there, we start to try and understand you know, what those objects might be, how we might conceive of them ontologically. And uh, my own interest in it is trying to understand um, you know, where uh, where uh, rhetorical relations might might emerge from that. So, you know, what are the uh, you know, what are the sort of ontological conditions that allow for symbolic action that uh, make it possible, right? And how and how those things sort of operate uh, between objects. But that sort of, in a nutshell, is what it. And you know, so you know, I don't know, Google it. But I mean, so, yeah. you know, I mean, there's I mean, the, one of the things is about about object-oriented ontology is that there is an extensive uh, online conversation in, in the blogosphere um, about, among these people. And also, many of their works are um, freely available via PDF online, so they publish in that fashion. So a lot of that stuff is, is there, and um, I'd be happy to point people to things if they, if they want to know. I'm just gonna let this thing point down to where I actually am. Um, I had a quick question for Josh. It seems like uh, the last 10 years has sort of included the proliferation of sitcoms that don't include laugh tracks anymore. Um, and I was wondering uh, if, if that might suggest any sort of shifts in, in attitudes towards canned laughter as a particular form of, of memory or if uh, maybe you thought it might just be you know the normalization of pre-recorded television as a medium or the sitcom as a genre or, or something else entirely? Uh, it's coming back within the past two years of the, some of the trade, uh, the trade news is that, oh, the laugh track is back and there's been a sort of explosion of that. Um, but why did it go away? Um, one of the things I would sort of trace is terms of the technology in terms of the shift from analog to digital. 
right? Because there's a different aesthetic sensibility that comes with the analogic, which is what laughter is, with digital, which is, is, is fundamentally recreative. Um, and I think that that, and I, don't, I wouldn't know how to work that out, how that is, I would work that out aesthetically, um, but that corresponds with um, a general mood shift. Um, um, and I think it's instructive, you said the last 10 years, because the mood changed after 9 11. Um, and that's about when laugh tracks started to drop out, and suddenly humor was taken seriously, right? Um, the chapter that I shared with you today begins actually after a couple of chapters on 9 11 and the use of recordings. Uh, in coverage of 9-11 to do all kinds of interesting um, and disturbing cultural work. Uh, this chapter begins with a sort of uh, discussion of when Saturday Night Live decided it was okay to broadcast themselves. Um, executives wondered when it was okay, quote unquote, for America to laugh again. And mm -hmm. I think that that sh tracks a sort of ideolog ideology of humor um, that is frightened of right, the kind of repetition compulsion that I'm, that I'm trying to get at, or the type of compulsion that would get us to a state of so-called mindlessness, right, in our mutual enjoyment of, say, um, humor. So I, you know, I think that, I mean, my answer to your question is I think there's been, a, there's been an ideological shift um, in the comic. I'm not sure how I'd work it out. It's an excellent question to sort of figure out how to conclude this, uh, this chapter, because it's not quite written, but um, I don't, does that help? Does that yeah. answer? Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and there's a certain gravity to the humor, right, that, that sort of comes in the post-9-11 moment where the reason the laugh track isn't there is so that you will no longer laugh it off but take what they're saying seriously, which is sort of an interesting, uh, interesting twist. Okay, well, let's thank our speakers.